Okay, we're going to get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to the second session of the SINCEL 2021 Speaker Series. My name is Jacqueline Delora. I am a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research with the Cellular Biophysics Department in the Spatz Lab in Stuttgart. Today we have two speakers, Professor Dr. Ramin Golistanian and Dr. Jan Steinkuhler. We encourage our audience to submit their questions using the Q&A button on the Zoom interface and also via our YouTube Live on the chat function. Today we will start with Professor Golistanian, who is currently the Director of the Living Matter Physics Department of the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization. He obtained his bachelor's from Sharif University of Technology in Tehran followed by his master's and doctorate from the Institute for Advanced Studies and Basic Sciences in Zanjan. His PhD work was supervised remotely by Mehran Kardar from MIT and was followed by an independent postdoctoral research fellowship at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical, Theoretical Physics at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Professor Golistanian then held academic positions at IASBS, the University of Sheffield, and Oxford University, where he became full professor in 2007. He has received many international awards and honors for his work and is especially distinguished for his work on active matter, including his role in developing microscopic swimmers and active colloids. We are happy to have Professor Golistanian with us today, where he will describe his work on how living matter self-organizes while breaking action-reaction symmetry. He will share his work with us for 30 minutes and we will follow up with 10 minutes of questions. So I will now pass it over to him so he may begin. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for the kind introduction. Uh, do you see the opening slide? Yes. Yes, okay. yes. thank you. Um, uh, so um, I'd like to uh, discuss with you uh, a, a general idea of how breaking action-reaction symmetry can lead to uh, different kinds of self-organization. And then I'd like to argue uh, uh, why this will be relevant to the topic of uh, building a cell or, or uh, uh, generally uh, ideas to uh, artificially make uh, living systems. Um, before I start, uh, I'd like to uh, basically tell you uh, where Göttingen is. So here you can see um, uh, Göttingen is a small town, basically in the middle of Germany, in the geographic center. Um, it's a very old uh, university town, um, and uh, it has a very rich history. Uh, for example, 46 Nobel Prizes um, have been associated directly with, with the university uh, so far. Uh, this is the building of our Max Planck Institute, which is on top of a hill. And here you can see the city of, of, of Göttingen. Uh, and there's some information about the size of our institute, around 350 uh, people uh, working there. Uh, so the general question I'd like to start with, um, which is a very simple question, uh, really, if you think about it, and that uh, is as follows. So suppose you uh, basically not think about you know, the synthesis aspect of questions about uh, uh, you know, how to create something that will follow uh, the structure and function and dynamics of the living cell, but think about uh, the rest of it. So suppose every single molecule that you can think of that makes a cell is available to you and you put them all in a sack. Uh, and then you ask the question, okay, I have my sack of chemicals. How do you go from this set of molecules into this functioning uh, organized uh, structure, which basically has its dynamics and so on. Um, and if you think about this question from this point onwards, essentially the question is a physics question because you're thinking about interactions that lead to structure formation, you're thinking about dynamics, uh, you're thinking about uh, evolution of the structure and so on. Uh, Another aspect which I think uh, is, is a very curious observation is that if you think about uh, cells, basically they all have 
pretty much the same structure. I mean, if you think about the biology, of course, there are very uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, th there is a variety of structures and, and there are uh, some differences. Uh, for example, we have the, uh, we have eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells and so on and different kinds of uh, classification. But the general very, very rough uh, architecture of a living cell is is the same thing. And basically, if you think about it, this suggests that uh, maybe life has emerged as a collective property of several ingredients coming together. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that in physics, uh, people think about when they think about phase transitions, for example, uh, you might uh, think about how magnetism uh, comes about from some molecular uh, ingredients such as spins uh, and how do you go from a system which has paramagnetic behavior, namely it responds to a magnetic field that is applied to it externally to one that has intrinsic magnetization itself. So it has ferromagnetic behavior or more complex collective effects such as superfluidity and superconductivity. So these are uh, features that can come out uh, when several very, very large number of ingredients with some microscopic feature come together and we basically um, undergo the process of spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, as it's called in physics. Uh, if you think about emergence, uh, there are some very non-trivial aspects to it. For example, uh, it is not always the case that you can uh, find signature of the emergent property of the collective in the microscopic elements. Uh, and sometimes, you see very sharp changes, you see basically sharp boundaries connecting and, and separating different types of behavior. Um, and typically in physics, when we want to study these systems, we have to find minimal models. Basically, we have to distill, you know, all the details that we know about the system to, to such a level that essentially it allows us to think about uh, these more complicated questions. Um, and then when we do that and we understand the collective behavior, we will go back and add as much detail as, as needed uh, to make the model more sophisticated. So uh, the general idea would be to do something like that for biology. And, and that essentially means uh, finding the right ingredients, the right minimal ingredients to go back to and then uh, building uh, the theory afterwards. So how do we think about uh, the structure of a living cell if we want to build such a model or such a description, essentially, we have to think about uh, the physical function of different elements. So we have information that is stored in the nucleus, let's say, for eukaryotic cells. We have um, structure, we have dynamic scaffolds, uh, we have energy factory, we have material transport, uh, which is basically constantly happening. And also, uh, we have uh, regions in which we make material uh, of, of specific types on demand. Um, and if you want to basically highlight or, or uh, draw a list of a few bullet points, you can um, uh, identify organizations, so spatial and temporal organization as uh, interesting features of the system, um, a system which has extreme stochasticity because all the molecules are subject to thermal fluctuations. And yet you can see very robust features and, and, and a, a fair amount of precision a system which has very high flux of material and energy, uh, for example, metabolism, which is uh, constantly feeding energy into the system. Uh, and often interesting features such as economy of uh, building blocks. Uh, you know, you, you use the same kind of proteins, let's say when the system, when the cell is in the division uh, phase or, um, or, or in, in uh, basically uh, structural elements when it's not in the division uh, phase. Uh, and a very interesting uh, feature from the physics point of view is the fact that, this is, uh, that the living cell is almost crowded to the level of uh, being completely jammed, but yet it has a very agile environment. So this is, um, I mean, the whole list is, is very interesting to, uh, to try and explore from a physical uh, point of view. Uh, very quickly, if you go back to what we know from equilibrium statistical physics, so that's the usual main toolbox that we have to study uh, collective effects uh, going back to molecular features and then coarse graining uh, to, a, to a large scale uh, description. Basically, we find out that none of those features can be 
understood using equilibrium statistical physics. We have macroscopic phases always. Uh, we never have hierarchical structure formation or, or uh, spatial and temporal organization in equilibrium systems. Um, and, uh, you know, in such high densities, we expect glassiness and, and slowness in the dynamics of the system and so on. So uh, we can clearly see that uh, we need new physics or new physical tools to understand because this is, even from a materials point of view, it's, an, it's a new uh, type of material. It's not, you know, similar to anything else that we are uh, familiar with. So in, in sort of, uh, if you want a, uh, short summary of what I said is equilibrium statistical physics will describe a system which is not alive. Um, and if you want to construct a living system, you need to bring in the magic of non-equilibrium activity. And I will explain uh, what that is. So essentially, you need to have some elements that will take the system constantly away from equilibrium. Uh, and, and that happens via mechanical and chemical activity. So the system will uh, be subject to all these microscopic elements that exert forces, mechanical um, uh, uh, forces and stresses by motor proteins, and then chemical activity by a chemical uh, enzymatic activity or, or catalytic activity. And uh, as a result of that, we will have gradients um, and uh, dynamic movement and, and formation of patterns and instabilities and so on. And this is basically the, the list here is the subject of the new emerging field of active matter or active soft matter. Um, and there are many different aspects of this that are being studied uh, under this title. Uh, then the idea would be to learn from these um, sort of uh, physical principles and put together simple elements so that we can make uh, self-organized structures. Uh, for example, something like a, a sperm could be a good example. So uh, how do we think about a sperm? It's a, it's a self-organized structure made of proteins, which undergoes an instability, a bifurcation uh, that leads to basically interaction with the fluid, which will lead to self-propulsion. And then the head will carry, uh, the container will, will carry a copy of a DNA, and that will be the main function of the system. So here you can see, uh, a Brownian dynamic simulation of um, a system of colloids which have chemical activity. I will describe in a moment uh, how that happens. And you can see that in the solution, they uh, find themselves much more efficiently than Brownian motion would um, allow them. And then they form this structure which undergoes an, an instability, a bifurcation. And then it basically uh, couples with the fluid the, the right way and leads to propulsion. Um, the way you can get motion in general from asymmetric catalytic activity um, is basically very simple. If you build in a structure which is geometrically uh, asymmetric, and then if there is chemical reaction or catalytic uh, activity, then the molecules will somehow uh, be broken down into uh, product uh, components, and then there will always be gradients interacting with the surface, which will lead to the propulsion of this structure. And the structure will go somewhere else, and it will, as long as it will find the reactants or the substrate molecules, it will break them down, and it will generate the same kind of reaction and still move. Uh, and this is a process which can be basically uh, very robustly uh, uh, demonstrated or produced in the experiment, and uh, we can learn things from this um, experiment, for example, we can even learn details about the catalytic activity from the uh, from the observation of mean square displacement and trajectories uh, in this system. Okay, so now uh, let's think about enzymes because uh, basically what I showed you so far was uh, examples at the micro scale of these colloidal objects that would mimic almost enzymes. Uh, but when we go down to molecular scale, to nanometer scale, um, the system becomes much more interesting because it has basically uh, fluctuations and uh, it, it also has. So if you think about an enzyme, what an enzyme does, so I'd like to call an enzyme a Maxwell demon. Basically, what it does is it breaks uh, equilibrium in a very sort of targeted way. Uh, it, it, it knows that this uh, chemical reaction, let's say you're thinking about a reaction coordinate, 
with a barrier which is large compared to thermal energy. Um, and then the enzyme somehow has information to uh, lower this barrier when the time is right um, by binding to the substrate or, or the reactant um, and facilitating that particular transition into a, a, a lower energy state. Uh, but then when the enzyme is not there, the reaction will again not happen. So it's a, it's a way that you um, basically trigger the reaction without, um, uh, without allowing it to happen everywhere. So it's, it's a tailored way to uh, drive the system away from equilibrium. And uh, it is now known that enzymes also respond to external gradients. Uh, uh, they uh, respond to uh, gradients of their substrates uh, and also they undergo enhanced diffusion when th their substrate is present. And, and, and these are basically ingredients that are sufficient in fact to predict very interesting self-organization coming from enzymatic systems. Uh, I won't go to the details of, of the, the mechanistic aspects, but basically it's possible for enzymes to respond to gradients in two different ways. And by tuning the concentration or the parameters, you can basically decide which mechanism will, will dominate. Uh, what is new about these enzymatic systems or, or catalytically active systems though, um, and that, that is in, already in the title of my talk, is that the way they interact with each other breaks uh, action-reaction symmetry. So we know from Newton's third law that uh, action and reaction between two components uh, will always balance each other. And that is, uh, you know, it's, it's a very important aspect in everything that we know in equilibrium physics. Um, but in these systems, uh, this symmetry basically breaks, which means uh, the interaction between two enzymes is almost like interaction between uh, higher organisms like humans, for example, or predator and prey. Uh, it doesn't have to be symmetric. And that is very interesting because it, it leads to uh, a very complicated dynamics. So you already saw uh, that video which showed uh, the self-organization that led to the formation of something like a sperm. You can make a small uh, sort of bound states that are self-propelled um, out of these uh, enzymes or colloids uh, if the condition is right. Um, so they act like ionic systems, but in, an, in a generalized non-equilibrium way. Um, and you can basically tabulate these structures that can form or clusters that can form based on the symmetry and, and predict what kind of non-equilibrium function they will have, such as self-propulsion and intrinsic spin and so on. Uh, you can also have dynamic function, for example, uh, you can have isomers that are both stable and then you would have the possibility to switch between them by thermal activation. And this way you, you create a system which will, let's say, respond to, uh, to some cues and behave uh, in a very uh, smart way, the way, for example, bacteria identify the uh, food source and, and respond to that. Uh, now, so far I talked about a small number of, uh, of these, uh, let's say enzymes or, or, or ca chemically active uh, uh, particles, but we know that in the cytosol, we have uh, a, a large variety of, of uh, molecules and components with, with chemical activity. And uh, from a colloid science point of view, we need to uh, ask questions about stability. So we know that when we make uh, mixtures, uh, you know, it's not trivial that you will always have the right kind of uh, structures to form. And we would like to understand what happens when we have these catalytically active uh, particles and uh, what kind of structures uh, do they form. Um, I, again, I'm skipping some of the details, but just for the uh, observers with a keen eye, I want to highlight that Basically, if we have a, a large mixture of these uh, catalytically active uh, particles, it is possible to engineer what kind of uh, basically uh, mixed states uh, or, or uh, uh, what kind of phase separated clusters will form uh, down to the level of engineering the specific stoichiometry. So what fraction of each uh, element can we uh, or will we have in this uh, uh, cluster that is forming. Um, and the way this, this works, I have a phase diagram for just two species, 
uh, is basically building on this asymmetry that we have in the interaction. So for example, uh, here in this diagram, you can see that um, we have a mixture of two elements with one interacting with one with attraction. So one attracts one and two attracts two and one and two repel each other. So this looks like um, a system which is uh, almost like a gravitational system, but if we assume that uh, the masses can have both positive and negative sign so that uh, opposite masses will uh, repel each other. On the other hand, here in this corner of the phase diagram, we have almost electrostatic looking interaction. So the same species uh, it self repels and opposite species attract each other. Uh, but then we have the mixed cases. For example, here one repels one, two attracts two, one is attracted to two and two is repelled by one. And this is a mixed sort of chasing interaction which will lead to uh, all kinds of uh, complex behaviors. Here you can see some of the uh, features that can happen at the level of the phase uh, dynamics. Um, and the molecules that I showed you are basically in this corner where the macroscopic phase is, uh, is still stable. Uh, so here you can see uh, Brangham dynamic simulations of the system where we expect to have, it's a binary system, we expect to have phase separation into a cluster which has a specific stoichiometry between the two uh, chemically active components. Um, and that's a very interesting feature because you can imagine having the possibility to have uh, clusters forming out of metabolic components that are somehow related to one another. So the substrate of one chemical reactions that will basically come from the product of the previous one and so on. And uh, these uh, uh, structures will uh, allow basically a very efficient organization of these structures uh, into uh, even clusters that move because this one uh, can undergo another uh, symmetry breaking at a uh, longer time scale and basically uh, self repelled by shedding uh, particles from one end. Um, it's also possible to completely phase separate uh, uh, the two different uh, clusters so that they don't mix with each other, as you can see in this video. Um, and then it's um, because we have uh, an analytical expression for the stability of these uh, suspensions, uh, it's possible to go to very large numbers of components and basically trigger a specific phase separation by simply adding a very small number of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, particles that will make the system move across the boundary. So it is a, a very robust feature that we can predict uh, the stability or uh, lack of it for, for this type of chemically active, uh, basically, suspension. Right, so, and then, uh, I, I motivated uh, this type of study uh, using a very uh, specific uh, type of system, which was enzymes or catalytically active systems with non-reciprocal interactions. Um, but what I want to highlight is what was very special about them was the fact that they could have non-reciprocal interaction. And uh, with systems that have uh, uh, action-reaction uh, symmetry breaking, you can have uh, basically very interesting types of phase behavior. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, what I described in the context of chemical reactions, even you can go all the way to larger scale and describe behavior between different kinds of animals or higher organisms or synthetic robotic systems which have non-reciprocal interaction. Uh, but I, again, I want to emphasize that what is interesting about these systems is the fact that uh, I mean, it's it's not it's not surprising that let's say a predator and a prey have an asymmetric interaction because they're both you know they both have brains and so on. But it is surprising that a single enzyme, which is five nanometers in size, can basically have the same kind of interaction with another enzyme. And you can imagine what level of complexity we will have access to if, at the molecular scale, already we can afford to have this kind of thing. So. Uh, one can basically study, you know, phase separations in general using general theories, uh, for example, the so-called con hilliard uh, theory by building in the non-reciprocal uh, nature of the interaction. Uh, and if we do that, uh, you can basically uh, 
observe different varieties. For example, here you can see a situation in which uh, in a binary mixture, we observe the formation of an active smectic phase. So this is a, a layer structure, almost like a smectic liquid crystal. If you're familiar with it, like a lamellar uh, uh, phase you get out of uh, lipids, uh, but it's an active one. So it's self-propelled and, and the bands that you form propel themselves in one direction. So you have a system of, you know, uh, spherical colloids with no, no particular symmetry, all of a sudden deciding to form bands and deciding to break the symmetry by selecting a length scale, selecting uh, the layer structure and, and selecting a direction for propulsion, which is a very interesting feature coming out of this uh, non-reciprocal aspect. Uh, here is another example in which you can see a 2D lattice. So this is basically a, a, a crystalline structure uh, that is self-propelled. And again, this comes out of spontaneous symmetry breaking with non-reciprocal uh, interaction. Um, okay, so um, I guess um, basically with this, I can summarize, uh, I talked about two different kinds of, uh, uh, I mean, apart from the general introduction that I gave, which was an important part of my talk, um, I gave two types of examples, so two types of different approach. Uh, uh, one, basically a bottom-up approach in which you would think about molecular details and, and mechanistic details and build uh, towards a larger scale uh, collective organization. Uh, but, you know, if you do it this way, you will have enough information about the details that you can, for example, uh, uh, make predictions or, or give uh, prescriptions about the specific uh, experimental realization. That is one way to study this kind of uh, system. And an alternative would be to look at uh, symmetry-based arguments, look at conservation laws and very uh, general principles that you can implement from the top down. And then basically you would uh, be able to identify minimal ways of classifying the behavior of the system. And then you would say, I can imagine that I have this many different phases and uh, these will be the key parameters to change to cover all that uh, if I'm interested. And then basically you can connect the two and, and this way uh, uh, you, you can basically understand uh, the maximum uh, capacity for this very simple ingredient that you put in uh, when you drive the system away from equilibrium. And I guess with that, um, uh, with that uh, take home message uh, would be that if you want to build an artificial cell, my recommendation would be to talk to a physicist about it because uh, basically they will uh, come up with a way uh, or they will be able to come up with a way to uh, use the, the physics involved to make uh, recommendations uh, in the form of using simple ingredients to drive the system uh, towards very interesting self-organization. And, and this way, um, I mean, the connection from thinking about simple ingredients to engineering collective organization is, is one which could be quite complex and typically people working in the physics community would basically have a very good um, uh, way of, of dealing with that. Uh, and I think with that, I can uh, stop and uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I will be looking forward to the questions. Great, thank you, Professor Golsanian. Um, so I have a question and, and maybe it's more of towards an outlook um, type of approach here, but so when you mentioned the idea that within the cellular cytoplasm, it's essentially a jammed environment. Um, I'm wondering how, how far away or what it would take to actually write down the system of equations that could lead to a, a realistic type of simulation um, like you like you show here in the video or in some of the simulations that you shared with us. Uh, so, I mean, basically what I described as the field of active matter is essentially uh, trying to do that. So it is, it is an ongoing field of research. Uh, you, you would still need to specify 
different uh, aspects. So, you know, one equation cannot describe everything, but there are people who are doing that in the last sort of five to 10 years. Um, and, uh, and a lot of progress has been made. So, uh, for example, this notion that uh, a very dense system, which you would expect to jam at equilibrium is not uh, jammed when you introduce these non-equilibrium features is already uh, relatively well studied and uh, people can identify the, the features that are needed. Uh, but still there is a lot uh, to be done. And, and that's why I think this is a very exciting uh, new development. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay, so we have another question from Felipe Quiroz. He says, great talk, very inspiring in terms of predicting emergent behaviors and patterns of self-organization in catalytically active systems. Do you see a big gap between 2D versus 3D work? Uh, the predictive power or framework holds well for 3D, does it? Um, yes, so uh, thanks for the question. Uh, the, the simulations that I showed you, uh, some of them were 2D and some of them were 3D. Uh, and um, uh, typically for these systems, uh, there is not much of a, you know, there's not much uh, uh, difference between the 3D uh, realization. Of course, you know, computer power uh, is the problem. So if you look at 3D cases, uh, you can simulate smaller systems. But um, uh, unless you want to study phases where, you, where, the, where access to 3D is essential, for example, if you want to study chiral phases, uh, spaces that have access to, to chirality, for example, spontaneous chiral symmetry breaking, uh, that can only happen in 3D and, you know, it's not possible in 2D, but otherwise the 2D will give a relatively uh, uh, reasonable uh, representation of what is happening in the system. Okay, thank you. Um, Darius Koster asks, looking at biological enzymes reaction systems, can you find design principles you have described, for example, in the top right corner of the two particle phase diagram? One attracts one, two repels two, one attracts two. Uh, the answer is yes. So you should, um, if you're interested to, to work on this experimentally, we can discuss basically uh, offline, but uh, the answer is yes. Uh, th these uh, mechanisms, uh, are, are very well studied. Um, and, and then you have to think about the experimental system uh, for which you can characterize these coefficients. And, and then you need to choose the right sign of the coefficients because uh, these parameters come from a table of interaction parameters. So the activity and the mobility will basically get multiplied and you need to choose the right combination. Thank you. Um, Christoph Karfuster uh, asks, seeing that some interactions are non-reciprocal, how would you say does the complexity of engineered biological systems scale with the number of involved components? Meaning can synthetic biologists truly develop orthogonal modu uh, modules which can be combined later? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, if, if you want just one very short answer, uh, I, I, as you anticipated, this particular feature will make uh, interaction between components non-trivial. Uh, and the reason for that is as simple as, uh, you know, anyone who works with dynamical systems knows that uh, when you increase the number of degrees of freedom, uh, you will basically allow for more complicated behavior. So it's the same kind of flavor. And the non-reciprocal aspect will simply uh, enhance because you know, if, if the interactions are reciprocal, that's already a constraint between the interactions. So this way uh, you will uh, generate uh, even a larger space of possibilities, let's say. Okay. Um, and Susan Atlas asks, when designing bottom-up with physics, one benefits in being able to control and model the system in detail. 
In addition to the type of top-down analysis that you described, are there additional mechanisms on the horizon to induce the type of messy biological robustness and emergent behavior characteristics of natural cells? Um, yes, so... Um, I think... Um, I think one way to approach this question is to think about uh, the modularity of, um, of this type of thinking. So you, at any scale, you will basically have a number of, uh, uh, let's say, degrees of freedom or parameters to think about. Uh, and then ideally you would like to be able to connect the different scales. And if you want to connect the different scales, um, in the end, the ideal situation will be that at, let's say, the next scale up, you will have uh, information about redundancy in the, in the sense that a number of things that you had in the microscopic scale will lead to basically the same kind of feature. And, and that you will take as a lesson uh, that will say, okay, those features for this particular question can be ignored. However, there are microscopic features already at the smaller scale that will lead to very, very large changes or significant changes at the next scale. And, and those you would take as the ones that have bigger influence, let's say, if you, if you want to call it that. So uh, the idea of going from one scale to another to another and this uh, journey across the scale essentially will help you identify the different features. It's, it's not just to get rid of details, right, to make it simple. It's also to identify the significance of these details and uh, focus on the sharp boundaries, let's say, in this uh, phase diagram, if you want. Um, and, and this is, it's not a trivial thing to do. You have to basically do whatever you can, going from top down uh, or, or uh, working your way from the bottom up using simple models or using more complicated models and doing systematic course grading. So all of these things will need to be done uh, hand in hand so that in the end you get the picture that you, that you want to get. Thank you. Um, Judith asks, uh, she says, thanks for the talk. Do you think that these simulations would be able to track the molecular dynamics of chemically driven systems? Um, so, I mean, in the spirit of, of the previous question, I would say uh, when, you, when, you, when you build a simulation based on a simple model, you essentially uh, hope to include enough details that will give you the right kind of behavior. If, if it turns out that you know, what you see is different, then you have to go back and think about what is missing in terms of the, of the, of, of the main ingredient. Uh, there are subtle features like enzymes, for example, are very temperamental. Uh, they don't always, you know, like their environments and so on. Of course, those things are not in this model. So I'm assuming, you know, very well behaved enzymes uh, uh, and, and, and a lot of other things. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, there has to be a, a sort of a compromise between those details and and the simplicity of models that will take you to a non-trivial uh, sort of far destination, uh, as it were. And, and, and this uh, interplay, I think, is, is, is something very interesting. Great, thank you. Okay, we have one last question, it's a little bit more technical. Um, just could you comment on the surface activity of the blue colloids in the phase separation simulations what is the origin of the surface coating when with the blue colloids? Uh, so basically uh, one of the parameters which I, uh, so I didn't go into the details of how you can tune the parameters, but uh, the surface coating does two things uh, in these catalytic systems. It is typically a, uh, for example, if you go back to a single colloid, let's say a Janus particle, if you coat it with platinum, what the, what platinum layer does in a solution of hydrogen peroxide is um, it basically catalyzes the reaction, but also it changes the Hamicke constant of the surface of the colloid 
with the uh, molecules in the solution. So with oxygen and peroxide and, and, uh, and the others. And uh, this combination basically changes both the activity parameter and the mobility parameter. Uh, in a real system, you have to essentially uh, look at all these details to find out what happens when you change the parameters. But in, in a theoretical study, you basically, you look at all possible values of these parameters and then look for basically all possible types of behavior. And that what, that's what makes uh, the phase background. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk today. It was extremely thought provoking. We appreciate it. And now we will move on.